When visiting Auckland as a child, I would stare out the window of the car, looking up at the large buildings and bridges, in particular the Auckland Harbour Bridge. I used to wonder how they were built and why they were built, and also how they were designed really intrigued me the most. This is when my interest in engineering first began, and I liked the idea that bridges were tangible. They served a purpose and benefited the community. I see bridges as a growth enabler for the communities in which they are built in. Over the past six years of my career, I've been lucky enough to work on some of the largest roading and bridge projects in New Zealand. And in 2012, this culminated in me working on my largest bridge project to date, where I developed bridging innovations which reduced the cost and increased the strength of that bridge on the project. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Karapura Gully Bridge and hope to share with you some design and construction innovations that were come up with during the project. The Karapira Gully Bridge is located along the, the Waikato Expressway and the Cambridge section of it. The Cambridge section is a new section of State Highway 1 and has been identified as part of the uh, Waikato Expressway as a Roads of National Significance project by the New Zealand Government. The highway is 16 kilometres long, has four lanes and bypasses around the east side of Cambridge. Along its alignment there are eight structures. These structures vary from uh, interchanges at the beginning of the project spanning over the highway, uh, interchange at the centre, Victoria interchange which links up to the new town or to the town of Cambridge and also State Highway 1B. Also there are local road bridges which span over the, exist the new highway and at the south end of the project is the Karapira Gully Bridge. This bridge is, uh, is 200 metres long, 24 metres wide, has, takes four lanes of traffic. The bridge spans over the 45 metre deep Karapira Gully, consists of a reinforced concrete substructure, steel superstructure, has barriers either side, a central medium barrier, and expansion joints at each end of the bridge to allow for thermal movement. My role on this project began in 2012 when HIP Construction teamed up with URS, now ACOM, to put a tender in for this project. The total project value is around $250 million. My role began as a, uh, in the tender design phase where I was given the role to come up with the concept and plan for this bridge as well as a few of the other uh, minor structures. My previous work on the Kaituna River Bridge and the Tauranga Easter Link Motorway, I think, and my technical leadership and skills which I displayed on this project was one of the reasons, I think, why I got given this role on this bridge. The, the bridge is founded on deep steel tube piles and, oh, sorry, forgot one thing there. After the tender design was completed, we moved on to the detailed design phase where I was the lead bridge engineer for this project, for the bridge. After the detail design was completed, I moved on to be the lead structural engineer and was responsible for the management of the design and construction interface for all eight structures on the project. The bridge is founded on deep steel tube piles. These vary in depth between 40 and 60 meters below ground level. And the photo here on the left is just showing how these piles are installed on the ground. These piles, there's a total of 64 of these piles and each of these can take a total load of 850 tonne which is the weight of around three Boeing 747s. These steel tube piles support the three piers in the base of the gully and the two abutments up at the edges of the bridge. Each pier consists of a reinforced concrete crosshead, two columns and a pile cap at the base which is supported by eight of these piles. During the construction phase I would go to site and carry out inspections as well. And this photo is showing me at the top of this uh, reinforced concrete crosshead before the reinforced concrete pour. As you can see, I'm pretty stoked to be up here. Um, just, it was awesome to see what I designed become a reality, and it was a great sense of achievement. This beam is larger than life at two and a half meters high and three meters wide. You could walk inside it. To get access up to this uh, pier head, we had to go in a crane in a man cage, which just three men could fit in. And as the crane slowly lifted me up, I, I thought, I don't need to go to Rainbow's Inn anymore. This was, it was an exhilarating ride. Um, as you can see, it's extremely high above ground level, um, and that's about the scale of how high I was up there. While the substructure was being completed on site, 
the steel superstructure was being fabricated in Napier by a company called Eastbridge. There's a total of 1,100 tons of structural steel fabricated for this bridge. And there's something different and special about the material used. The, br the material is called weathering steel, which differs to normal carbon steel, as it doesn't need a corrosion protection system. It doesn't need to be painted or galvanized. And this is because of the way that this material reacts with the atmosphere. Over time, corrosion occurs on carbon steel and the weathering steel. However, the weathering steel forms a protective barrier by the corrosion byproduct, and this effectively halts the corrosion process. The steel was all uh, transported to site using heavy equipment and large trucks, as you can see here. And in late 2014, the first steel beam was erected on site. This was a major milestone for the project as it signalized this bridge was over half complete, and we were just over the halfway mark in the overall project. This beam here uh, was lifted using cranes, as were all of them. And you can see the method of we just um, strapped the beams up, lift them into position, and all the pieces were bolted up on site. As the bridge construction progressed, uh, the reinforced concrete panels were started to be placed at one end of the bridge as the steelwork was continuously being erected along. A total of uh, over 23,000 bolts were used to hold all of the structural steel elements together. This was critical, having a modular type construction with all the elements being put together like a large Meccano set. It was pretty awesome designing this as well and knowing that all these pieces would fit, fit together. A relatively constru simple construction method was used using uh, cranes to lift in all the pieces when I say relatively simple, nothing is ever simple when you have a bridge this big. Making sure everything fits and design right is, is very uh, challenging. Precast concrete panels were fabricated off site and then installed on the bridge. And this was another modular component of the bridge which sped up the efficiency and construction of the bridge. At the end of last year, the bridge was completed and the surfacing, the two barriers, expansion joints were installed. And this is a photo of the bridge just before it opened to public last December. And now the, the highway is open and I'm sure a few of you have driven over this bridge already. I just want to touch on the design philosophy of the bridge and discuss some of the key innovations that uh, were come up with for the bridge. We wanted to come up with a structurally efficient design by using structural steel as it's a high strength to low weight material. And the spans of the bridge being 50 metres for each span, the span is between each support, meant that conventional concrete and precast beams weren't an efficient uh, method of construction or economic. A simple construction method, as I said, was preferred rather than having uh, large mechanical equipment uh, to lift up large pieces of equipment and uh, small cranes were used to construct everything. A low environmental impact was sought by removing all the uh, the permanent works from the steep slopes. These steep slopes are over 45 degrees, and we didn't want to. We wanted to leave that as much as possible, and we didn't want to risk uh, increase the risk of the health and safety of the workers on the project by having them work on these steep slopes. Future maintenance was a, a big consideration, and the that's why weathering steel was chosen in the end. So, as you can imagine, going back in a few, in 40 years' time, roughly, to recoat and repaint the bridge. Because of the weathering steel material, we don't need to do that now. All bridges in New Zealand are designed for seismic and earthquake loading, and the Karapira Gully Bridge is no different. The challenging constraints of the steep slopes and in the base of the gully is uh, weak sand, and this is expected to liquefy in a seismic event, meaning that when a seismic event comes along, the load from the bridge needs to be transferred down below this liquefied sand layer meaning that from the top of the bridge to the point of resistance was over 60 metres. During the tender phase when we were coming up with the concept for this bridge, we investigated many different options, span options, material uh, options to come up with the best design. But however, most of these were causing displacements of over one metre when we were conducting analysis. This was an unacceptable limit and, would, and with the bridge this high, it would lead to a progressive collapse. So we came up with the idea of providing a rotation connection to the top of the pier. And this is what we call a pier moment connection. 
This is a 3D rendering of, of what that connection looked like. And I think in the first video, you would have quickly seen a, a sh shot of, of how that worked as well. This connection uh, conducts, uh, is, uh, consists of large steel bars. There's eight of them per beam. And these are tensioned up to a load of 2,500 ton for all eight of them, providing a huge compression and clamping load, which locks the steel beam to the reinforced concrete beam meaning they act as one and it's an efficient method for transferring load between the steel and the concrete. When coming up with this concept I did research overseas and what was done in New Zealand and I couldn't find anything that was suitable to this bridge uh, and I believe this is the first of its design for a bridge in New Zealand. The whole point of this connection was to reduce the movement and the loading on the supporting bridge structure and it did. It reduced the displacements to down to about 400 mil which was an acceptable limit compared to one meter with other options we were coming up with. This reduced the cost and in turn increased the strength and the redundancy of the, of the bridge. The way it, it increased the redundancy is it provided a connection and linked all the columns together rather than all the columns acting in isolation if they weren't connected to the top of the steel. I just want to cover some of the innovations for the Karapiro Gully Bridge. The typical structure for this bridge would consist of reinforced concrete uh, beams of uniform depth, may have a total weight of 7,600 tonnes, did some checks for this, uh, would have multiple sets of piers along its alignment, say maybe a seven span bridge rather than a uh, four span bridge was the final solution. And these piers would be placed on the sides of the, the steep slopes to achieve those smaller spans. This had an estimated total structure cost of $25 million in comparison with the Karapiro Gully Bridge. The, in contrast to this bridge, we had steel beams made from weathering steel. The, this was also meant that our future maintenance costs were reduced and we don't have to get back and uh, carry out works in the future to recoat these beams. We, changed, uh, we varied the depth of the beam sizes so that the beam sizes matched the flow of the forces in the bridge. The total bridge weight was around 6,000 tonnes in comparison, this is a lot lighter than a reinforced concrete uh, type structure. And this meant it reduced the demand on the, the bridge in seismic loading, and also the, just the total weight on the bridge substructure as well. The innovative design for the moment connection. This, this was one of the key factors in driving the design and making this bridge an, if, an efficient and innovative bridge. And all this can be realized when the final cost of the bridge was $15 million in comparison to $24 million estimated at the concept design phase for a bridge of this size. This is a massive cost reduction of 40%. I, th I believe the Karapiro Gully Bridge is, in, is it going to be a benchmark for future bridges as it utilises innovative designs using weathering steel as a new and emerging material in New Zealand. And I think in the future we'll see uh, a lot more steel bridges being constructed with weathering steel. And this is the bridge is a prime example of an innovative and efficient design. Projects we have completed demonstrate what we know. Future projects decide what we will learn. This quote really resonates with me and brings me back to the uh, theme of bridging innovation. We must not let our current knowledge and thoughts uh, sorry, hinder us from developing new and innovative concepts and expanding our field of vision. I've learned so much working on the Karapiro Gully Bridge project and the entire Cambridge Bypass and I look to the future where I'll continue to learn. Thank you.